שבת שלום. וישלח begins with one of the most famous scenes in all of Torah. The scene of Yaakov, Jacob, wrestling with something. <laughs> It's a little unclear exactly who he is wrestling with. Uh, is it a human? Is it an angel? Well, we get a clue by the renaming that comes at the end of this episode on this uh, wrestling match. Uh, Jacob takes on a new name, one that might be familiar to you. The name of? Israel. Israel, which means? Wrestle with God. Maybe. See, the problem is that Israel is then explained as being given, because this is a person who has contended, wrestled, prevailed, depending upon how you want to interpret the first word, im Elohim v'im anashim. That this is the man who has wrestled with Elohim, which could mean God. After all, when we say Eloheinu, we are referring to God. Elohim is one of the names of God. But Elohim can also mean lowercase g. That is to say, G-O-D-S, gods. It is the same word, which is a little bit of a head scratcher when you're trying to interpret a piece of text. Is this saying that this is the man who has wrestled with God, capital G, the creator of the universe? Or is this the man who has wrestled with gods? Not that there are others, but Elohim can simply mean the other spiritual powers of the world. This would be parallel then to the Iman Hashim, where it says that Jacob has wrestled with people, wrestled with men. But of course, that second part often gets ignored when interpreting the name Yisrael. We always say uh, very quickly that this is, we are the people who wrestle with God, and certainly we give God a lot of uh, grief over our days. But what about that second period, that second point? that we are people that wrestle with Anashim. Where did Jacob wrestle with Anashim? Where did he wrestle with people? Here he is wrestling with an angel, perhaps, wrestling with a spiritual power. Where is he wrestling with people? As far as we know from his history, when push came to shove with his brother after he had stolen the blessing, what did he do? He ran away. When push came to shove with Lavan after he cheated him and said, oh, sorry, You've got the uh, other, other daughter, uh, but if you want the other one, you'll have to work another seven years. What did Jacob do? He sucked it up and worked another seven years. And when Levan began to get um, greedy over the way that Jacob was enriching himself through his work for Levan, Jacob ran away. This is not a person who wrestles with people. Where is the wrestling? Where is his willingness to engage in the, the nitty gritty, the down in the mud kind of wrestling to secure his legacy, his future for himself, for his children? Well, actually, in all of those places he is wrestling, but especially that last one. When he is running away from Levan, what direction is he running? Hmm? Home. He is running back to Canaan. Now, wait a minute. When I said the very beginning example of him running away, where was he running from at that point? Home. Now he's running back. But what's waiting for him at home? Esau, his brother, the one who had promised revenge, who had promised murder. And yet Jacob, when he is leaving Levan, is heading into danger. He is braving what is about to happen because he has set his mind, his heart, his spirit to the idea that indeed he needs to be back in the land of Canaan, the land of Abraham, and the land of Isaac. He needs to come home, and he is willing to face his brother. Now, he is terrified of the physical confrontation that might happen. He divides his family into multiple camps, putting one on this side, one on that side, to try and make sure that if Esau comes with his army, that at least a few survivors may remain. But being brave doesn't mean not being afraid. Being brave means being afraid, but doing it anyway, because it's what you must do for yourself and for your family. And Jacob shows that courage. You might be thinking, well, you know, there was a big prize to be won, the land of Israel. This is what he was coming back for. But who was his adversary, his brother Esau? The man who had blustered, I am going to kill my brother. I will have my revenge. I will take everything back for myself. 
the man who shows up with hundreds of armed people to greet his brother, when he realizes that his brother is not going to run, when he realizes that his brother has come back to stay, what does the Torah say Esau does? He hugs him and then walks away. Walks away not just from the relationship, but walks away from Israel. Walks away from the land of Canaan. He walks off to the land of Seir, becoming the people of Edom. He gives up on his claim. For all of his bluster, for all of his posturing, for all of his flexing, when push came to shove, Esau was not prepared to wrestle with his brother for the right for the land of Israel. Instead, he looked at the wealth that he had already amassed. Esau was a wealthy man by this point, and said, you know what? It's not worth it. I'll just go live over here in modern-day Jordan. Not anyone can tell you that Israel is better. Uh, he walked away from that wrestling. He was not prepared truly to wrestle. He was always prepared for an unfair fight. Esau was absolutely prepared to be a robber, a bandit, a person that would oppress others. But given, given a fair fight where there was a chance that he might lose or at least get injured, he was out. He was not going to wrestle on that level. So there is Jacob wrestling with his brother, not by actually getting into the mud, but by showing up to the fight and by showing his brother that he was prepared to fight and ending up not needing to fight at all. He won the battle before it began. But where is the spiritual battle then? Where is the Elohim? Where are the divine influences that Jacob is fighting? Well, Jacob had been wrestling his entire life with this influence. It was what we might call the spirit of his brother, but it was a spirit that was embedded within Jacob as well. After all, they were twins. Jacob, like his brother, had a thing for stuff. He liked the idea of having that extra birthright, to have that extra inheritance. He liked the idea of getting rich when he was working with Levan, of gathering more sheep, more goats, and of having the uh, wealth amassed for him. He liked that. Indeed, when God gave him the promise when he would leave, when he left, with the famous vision of the ladder, he weighed it in merchant terms, saying, I will give back 10%. Although, as I talked about last week, there are other ways to interpret this. But now, now Jacob is wrestling with that. When he is approached, approaching his brother, what does he do? He takes all of the wealth that he has, all of the goats and the sheep and all of the various accoutrements uh, that he has carried all the way back from Syria, and he sends it to his brother as a gift. He says, here, take it. You want stuff so bad? You're so angry about the inheritance? You're so angry about things? Have it. This is Jacob overcoming that temptation, that, that greed, that selfishness that was in him since he was a child, and finally rising above it being willing to give it all away for what was actually important, his family and his heritage in his homeland. Nothing else really mattered. And again, we can understand the opposite by looking at the actions of Esau when he left the land of Israel, because it parallels almost exactly the leaving of Abraham, or Avram as he was called, when he left his home in Haran. It says that Abraham left his home in Haran and he came to the land of Israel and he brought with him his wife and Lot and all of the possessions that they had and all of the souls that they had made there in Haran. When Esau leaves Israel, it says he also leaves taking with him his wives, his children, his households and all of his possessions and goes off to Seir. You notice something missing. No mention of having made anybody. The Midrash says that when it says that Abraham and Sarah made people in the land of Haran, they weren't um, sculptors. They were making souls. They were drawing people closer to God, closer to the idea of monotheism, closer to the idea of the ethics and morality that God has embedded within our world. That they had turned souls around and helped them find this new path. Esau had no such interest in the world. He didn't care about people's souls. He didn't care about people's life. What did he care about morality? He was a walking paragon of immorality. And so when he left, he took what was valuable to him. And the souls of others 
was not of any worth to him at all. Jacob, on the other hand, we see time and time again, is willing to throw everything away for the people around him. Time and time again, he will leave a wealthy place, a very lucrative opportunity, in order to save people. This is ultimately what it meant to become Yisrael at this moment, for him to be fully awakened and to realize that he is able to throw away all of that stickiness of the hands of Esau, all of that graspingness that he had seen in his brother and seen in himself, and that he is able to stand on his feet and defend himself and his family and what truly matters in his life. Ultimately, this is what being Israel is about. And ultimately, it is because of the model of Jacob and what he has given to us in his legacy that has allowed Israel to persist in every corner of the world and throughout every age and every hardship. Time and time again, we have stood, we have been strong, we have wrestled with people, and we have wrestled with ourselves in what is right in the world. And we continue to be victorious. I know that because we're here. Shabbat Shalom.